Well, welcome back, everyone, and we're into the home stretch. I'd like to invite Livio Nicoli, CEO and Engineering Manager of Internet Engineering, to come up and introduce our final keynote speaker for the day. Livio, can you come on up and do the honors? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm thankful to be here representing Internet Energy Solutions Canada um, and being a sponsor to this great event that now we anticipate coming every fall. Uh, Tom and his uh, great team have put together another lineup of good presenters that have allowed us for a day to listen and think. Um, at Internet Energy Solutions Canada, we've evolved over the last decade in Ontario and also now spreading out to other parts of Canada to do the work that we love, be it um, building sciences, renewable energy development, or greenhouse gas accounting, we're looking forward to seeing a next decade where we can invite new professionals, the young professionals, to join our industry. And on that note, it's important, I think, before I invite the professor doctor uh, <laughs> to come up uh, that I have a little bit of a homework assignment for everyone <laughs> and it's more to reiterate what we heard this morning uh, as we end the day. I think it's important that everyone individually here and as an industry we have a voice in the conversation that's happening right now. So in particular on the website for the Ministry of Environment we see that there are several bills that are up for comment. And I think all of us have something to add to that. And so I'd ask you to, to do that. Um, we were in a situation right now where um, we hear about political leaders that are concerned about climate change and they know something needs to happen, but they're attacking the exact uh, initiatives and potential investments that we need to create those sustainable buildings and communities that we're talking about today. And on top of that, uh, the message is that the plan will come later. Well, we all know that climate change didn't start yesterday or a year ago. If they're not with a plan yet, then the reality is, is that there's no meaningful plan coming unless it's our industry that gives a voice to the conversation. So I hope all of you have a chance to do that little homework assignment as we move forward. And uh, now I'll invite <laughs> the professor, Dr. Timothy Beatley. It's my honor to welcome you and introduce you as the next great communicator that we've had today and to bring home the conversation and learning that we've had and discuss designing cities that love nature. S internationally recognized as a leader in sustainable city research, Dr. Timothy Beatley is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities and Chair of the Development of Urban and Environmental Planning in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. He has been an author or co-author to enough books that can fill up a shelf on my library. <laughs> and most recently, one of the most recent ones being uh, blue, blue Urbanism, Exploring Connections Between Cities and Oceans. Dr. Timothy Beatley is, re is regularly contributing to articles in Planning Magazine and blogs on the topics of biophilic cities and green urbanism. There's lots of, there's lots of thought and experience, no doubt, that we can tap into today with him being here. And so I'd like us to all welcome him together. Thank you, I'll just hop up here. Very good. Well, let's see if I can find the uh, clicker. Where is that? Oh, here we go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I realize I'm the last speaker, right? I'm, I'm uh, what stands between you and whatever else follows. The bar, maybe, or other things, I understand. <laughs> Drinks. So, so that's quite a responsibility or quite a burden or something. I don't know. But I'm delighted to be here. And um, uh, I have some homework for you as well. I always start by saying this. Um, I'm, I'm going to hopefully get us all comfortable with the, using the word biophilia. And in particular, the version biophilic 
biophilic city. So, so cities and biophilia together, merging those ideas. Um, I would also like to ask, and, and so at some point later in the day, maybe at cocktails or somewhere, you have to, maybe not in this group, because I think you probably already know that term and use it a lot, um, but you have to use biophilia somewhere. You know, it, uh, sprinkle it into, into conversation somewhere tomorrow where it, where it might be unexpected. Uh, the other thing is please take a look at our website, biophiliccities.org, and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about now, uh, you can find more information uh, there. So um, for me, I'm, I am an urban planner, city planner, and we are thinking a lot about climate change, actually, and we think cities are have to really uh, be part of the answer, a big part of the solution. Um, uh, and that means they're going to have to be more com compact and dense and more walkable, and uh, we have to pretty quickly transition to renewable energy. Uh, we have to profoundly reduce their energy and ecological footprints. So the vision of cities, of sustainable, resilient cities of the future ha have, to be com have to be compact and dense cities. Well, if that's the case, can we also ensure that contact with nature, connection with the natural world? And my major point today is that nature is absolutely essential. It's not something optional. We uh, need it. We need contact with it uh, daily, if not hourly. Uh, and it has to be integrated into the places we spend most of our time, around our, um, where we live and where we work. Uh, so that's the, the, the essence of the, the, the main point. The question mark there, cities and nature together, is not really a question mark. We're arguing that you have to have dense and can have dense, compact cities that are also natureful, profoundly natureful. So uh, about uh, 2010 or so, we started something called the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia to explore uh, how cities uh, were, in fact, creatively incorporating nature into their design and planning. Have to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, uh, Ed Wilson, uh, um, professor at Harvard. Uh, he uh, wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really coined it in the way that we know it today or we think of it today. This innate connection, this innate affiliation with, with nature. We're hardwired, really, uh, to need that, that, uh, that contact with the natural world. Uh, we're carrying with us our ancient brains. We've co-evolved with nature, so it's n not a big surprise that we're uh, happier, more comfortable, uh, able to lead more meaningful lives when we have nature uh, all around us. There he is again, or there he is, uh, Ed Wilson. The human species has grown up uh, in nature. So when you think about what it is that makes us feel better, what we uh, get joy from, what we're drawn to, it's all of these things. It's, um, it's water and trees and flowers and nature. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, evidence about this, um, and that's essentially what biophilia is. Um, Stephen Kellert, Steve Kellert, uh, a colleague and, and friend for many years, unfortunately, has passed away, but another major proponent of this idea of biophilia and biophilic design. And Stephen used to like to talk about how biophilia, uh, he, he described it as a weak genetic tendency. And by that, he, he didn't mean it was unimportant. He just meant that we carry this innate affiliation, this, in, this innateness, this innate draw uh, to, to nature, but it has to be exercised. It has to be cultivated. Um, and so uh, this is actually an image from a uh, film. Um, we, one of the things we do is make documentary films about what cities are, are doing to, to uh, foster these connections to nature. And this is actually uh, one from a film called Ocean Cities. It's all about uh, cities connecting to the marine nature uh, around them. It's just come out and it's starting to play on PBS stations in the, in the US. And, uh, and, and this is a, a sort of a, an example uh, of what Steve Keller was talking about. So we, we need cities that, that foster, that cultivate that connection with the natural world. So there is a nature center, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Biscayne Nature Center, uh, just south of Miami. And we spent a day filming there. And, and they have this wonderful program where they take fifth graders uh, out into the water. This is into the Atlantic Ocean, basically. and they. Uh, form in groups of about seven or eight kids, and each group has their own naturalist who walks in, goes into the water with them. Each pair of kids is given a net, and they're encouraged to go out and sort of scoop the bottom and pull it up and see, and see what they can find. 
And these are kids from mostly underserved neighborhoods, not living terribly far away from the water, but had never really done this before, hadn't really had any exposure to that marine uh, world. So we had a film crew and we followed them into the water and it was pretty, a pretty remarkable uh, experience. It stayed with me and we were trying to kind of keep the cameras, you know, from getting wet and trying to capture uh, th this, these moments of awe, essentially. So, so at one point, a, a child uh, pull, pulls up a net, and there is something in it that looks to me like a slightly overinflated tennis ball. And uh, it turns out to be a puffer fish. Um, and when the, the, the child puts it back into the water and there's a little floating tank that they're, they're sort of holding things in, and it, it deflates and becomes a fish again in the eyes of the kids. And, the, and you see, you know, the kids are oohs and ahs and just a profound uh, reaction. And I think that day, uh, hope that day, I'm pretty sure had a pretty profound impact on those kids. And it did on me as well. And it was a reminder about how much awe and wonder there is around us and often very close to where we're living in cities. Um, but that's the challenge. One of the challenges of a biophilic city is to pr provide more opportunities like that and to judge the success and the quality of urban life by the density or the number of those moments of awe, moments of awe um, that we encounter, uh, that we experience over the course of, of, a, of an average day. So um, we have a lot of evidence, a lot of research, and we could spend the whole time talking about that. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sampling, I've got a couple of slides here. This is a just remarkable uh, evidence coming uh, fast and furious in the last two to five years, especially coming out of uh, psychology and public health and medicine and economics, uh, really remarkable, showing the power of nature in contact with the natural world. This is a study from the University of Exeter in the UK showing the relationship between green neighborhoods and re reduced depression, anxiety, and stress. Um, any number of other studies we could show. Here's another recent one. These are all in the last few months, the association between uh, uh, de adolescent depression and uh, the extent of, gr of, of the greenness in your neighborhood. So the greener the neighborhood, the lower uh, adolescent depression. Um, you know, vegetation diversity, biodiversity, and its relationship to asthma, uh, even schizophrenia, um, higher rates in, in places where there's less uh, nature. So uh, I did a, a presentation for a big uh, health company a few months ago in Oregon, a company called Moda, and I was trying to, to find some clever way of uh, synthesizing all of this research and putting it all in some clever diagram or some uh, clever PowerPoint slide, and I couldn't really do it, and just started listing things. And when you start to list them, it's pretty amazing. Lower depression, I've already mentioned a lot of these things. Improved mood, improved cognitive performance, the more nature we have around us. Increased physical activity, the greener the neighborhood, the more likely we, we are to be outside and delivering health benefits in that way. Um, higher, you know, uh, reducing social isolation, something mentioned in the last uh, presentation. Uh, higher creativity. We have all this evidence now that suggests that in the presence of nature, we are more likely to be generous. We are more likely to be cooperative when we have nature around us. So uh, a pretty strong case to make that we are better human beings when we have nature around us. And not surprising, again, given the evolutionary history of our species, where do we feel uh, the most comfortable? Where do we feel the most at ease, the most generous is, is likely to be um, when we have nature uh, around us. So if you, you try to put all this together, for us, we use the word flourishing a lot because it sort of captures everything. It's that um, health and, and uh, meaning and purpose, all those things that, that really make our lives worth living and make city life uh, worth, worth living. Uh, so a lot of our time is spent thinking about um, what cities are doing to incorporate nature into their design and planning um, and trying to collect these stories and tell these stories and a, a, a lot of time spent sort of thinking about what constitutes a biophilic city. What are the qualities? What are the characteristics? Um, and these are some of them on the next few slides. Uh, they're clearly, as I've already 
kind of made this point. there are cities that connect us to nature and and of course connect us to each other in the process. so actively connect us to the natural world they are cities that have a lot of biophilic buildings and i'm a major proponent of biophilic design and we've seen wonderful you know kind of advancements there and and at the level of buildings um but a biophilic city is more than just a city with lots of biophilic uh, buildings. A biophilic city is more than just biophilic buildings. It's everything else. To paraphrase Jan Gale, it's the life between the buildings. It's all, all the spaces between and beyond the buildings. It's room or rooftop to region or bioregion and every level in between. Right? It's everything. It's a whole of city uh, vision and a whole of city approach. So it's gardens and parks and trees and nature, birds, trails, landscapes, all of those things. Um, it is about nature connections and human connections in the natural world, but it's also increasingly our vision is a, a cities that uh, contribute in, in important ways to a, a global conservation. We know, of course, that cities harbor a lot of, a lot of um, uh, fauna, uh, flora and fauna, and we know that uh, cities can, in fact, be part of the the, the answer to global conservation challenges. It's also a matter of coexistence and caring for nature. So there's an ethical dimension to this uh, as well. We recognize, we believe that, that biophilic cities mean that we've got to, to uh, see our cities as places of shared nature um, and recognize that our, our lives are enhanced uh, immensely by having uh, other forms of life around us. But it's also, we're also duty bound in a sense. This is an ethical question, ethical uh, dimension. So uh, coexistence is another part of what we mean by a biophilic city. So um, a longer story with how we got to our network. We started this biophilic cities project in 2010 or so. That started a research phase. We had initial funding from a Washington DC foundation, the Summit Foundation. We're now, I think, on our fifth Summit Foundation grant. Um, in 2013, at the end of the research phase, we brought uh, representatives from all of our 10 initial partner cities to Virginia for a four-day conference. And we weren't really planning to do this, but at the end of the four days, we decided that we really needed a network. And there was such a esprit de corps, there was such um, wonderful relationships and, and wonderful sharing of experiences between this group that we really thought we need to continue. So on the last day of this four days, uh, these representatives went out and signed this sort of large um, publisher's clearinghouse sized pledge, Biophilic Cities Pledge, and you can find it on our website. And thus we launched this global Biophilic Cities Network. And about, uh, about a, a half year ago, or we're, I guess we're halfway through our first year, of a two-year Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, which is intended to help us expand and grow this network. So we're at about 20 cities. This map, I think, is reasonably up to date, maybe missing one or two places. Um, but our goal uh, through this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant is to, is to have at least 50 cities in our network by the end of the two-year period. And if I forget to say this, I think I have a slide at the end, Toronto, needs to be in our global network. Um, and so help us to, to, to do that. Toronto's obviously already a biophilic city. So there's the logo. Uh, do take a look at the website. There is a protocol set of guidelines for uh, how partner cities officially join the network, join as partner cities. If you're interested as an individual or an organization, uh, you can also join, just go online and sign the pledge and you'll be part of our uh, network. And we have thousands of people now around the world that are, are part of it. So some of the things that we're doing uh, to advance this agenda and advance this idea, we've, we've started an online uh, journal called Biophilic Cities. You can find that through the biophilicities.org. This is the cover of the inaugural issue. Uh, you may recognize Edmonton on the, uh, on the cover. Um, we are about to publish our fourth issue, so it's a relatively new journal. Wonderful content, wonderful stories, really amazing things going on in cities around the world. Um, this is the uh, last issue, cover of the last issue, which has Bos Bosco Verticale, the, these twin forested towers in, in Milan. 
and that's a, a lead story authored by uh, Reed Kaufman, who uh, edits something called the Living Architecture Journal, uh, and also a wonderful issue. Please take a look at that. Uh, we are uh, engaged in lots of partnerships with a, lot, a number of other organizations. This is uh, actually one a slide to, to tell you about the uh, partnership with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. We co-organized the Biophilic Cities uh, lecture series um, last year. And the woman on the right is uh, Catherine Warner, and she's the sustainability director for the city of St. Louis. And she, is, uh, she presented on that day about their pretty remarkable program to get people to plant butterfly gardens. It's a really wonderful story. The mayor she worked for, he's n no longer mayor, but it's a terrific story of a mayor who, who decided to set the goal. That he, he pledged, uh, promised that the city would plant 250 butterfly gardens by a certain date. Mayors promise many things, right? Butterflies and gardens not usually, you know, high on the list. Uh, so this is another indication of what a biophilic city uh, uh, could be or, or should be. And, and Catherine had a lot to do with getting this program going. So they met their goal, and not 250, but actually more than 400 butterfly gardens. And they're all on an interactive map uh, that you can find uh, at the City of St. Louis um, webpage. So uh, really wonderful things. Um, the other, one of the other things that we've discovered is that we, t a really effective way to tell these stories, like my example from Miami, is through films, through documentary films. And so we have uh, short films about all of our partner cities, I think, um, and we aspire to tell uh, a, a lot of uh, stories about the, the kind of wonderful uh, practices that they're engaged in. So this is a, a screenshot of, from our Singapore. Singapore is a, one of our original um, uh, member cities, biophilic uh, partner cities. And Tom, I know you, you we had a special interest in talking a little bit about Singapore. So I've got a little bit more about, a little bit more detail about what that uh, that city and country is doing. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful story of a fernery at a, at a, at a green school. So we, we have discovered that for a little bit of money, uh, we basically show up with a camera and we ask people to describe what they've done and what, what's, you know, what's their project, what's their program, tell the story. So these are relatively low budget films, but they um, get watched quite, quite a lot. So this one actually, all of them are, are on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. I'd love for you to go and watch some of them. This one has uh, had more than 100,000 views. So that's not bad for a relatively low budget film. Um, it is a pretty special place. We like to say that that's not quite Beyonce or Taylor Swift. Right, yeah, you know, we're, we've, we've, well, I won't go into Taylor Swift. We, we've had some recent events that she's become a little more political, right? Um, I've been aware that her Twitter account has 100 million followers or something like that. So we aspire to that kind of engagement as well. But documentary films are a wonderful way to do that. Uh, we have a Biophilic Cities, a Biophilic Codes Initiative, which is about collecting, categorizing, sharing uh, codes of various kinds, ordinances, model uh, ordinances. That's a lot of what uh, the network is about, sharing the good things that cities are doing. These are examples from uh, San Francisco, uh, one, also one of our original 10 partner cities. Um, they are, they have become the first American city to mandate the installation of green roofs. I know Toronto did it first uh, North America, North American first, um, but we're quite quite Im impressed with San Francisco and some of our other partner cities. Portland has just adopted a mandatory green roof requirement uh, as well. The image on the left, uh, many of our cities are developing some form of bird-friendly design requirement. That's another thing Toronto has pioneered, uh, so we have to give a lot of credit to this uh, city on that as well. So comparing, contrasting, sharing these codes and the wonderful innovations that cities are engaged in. So what is a biophilic city? Maybe a little bit more about about the, this discussion that we're having um, uh, about this. And there are a lot of different ways that we could um, describe what a biophilic city is. There are different uh, uh, design qualities. One um, is shown in this example. This is a, a map uh, of Helsinki, Helsinki's wonderful green space uh, network, that the idea that you have nature around you, all around you where you're living, and that you can move 
uh, from your place of work or your home to progressively larger uh, amounts of nature. In the case of Helsinki, you can go from a very dense center of that city all the way out to old growth forests at the edge of, of, of town. So again, this idea of a whole of city approach, a room or rooftop to region or, or bioregion. We like to say that uh, this is a vision of a continuous nature, kind of seamless nature, um, and overcoming sort of the divisions between built and, and natural. This is an image, again, from Singapore, very uh, important uh, uh, biophilic hospital, KTPH, it's uh, known by, it's acronym. Uh, part of our, we have a chapter in our Singapore film about this, really wonderful story of a design um, program given to the architects. We want a hospital design where uh, when the patients check in, blood pressure goes down, heart rates go down, stress levels go down, not the reverse, which is usually uh, what happens with hospitals. And so multiple levels of green roofs, a wonderful, beautiful green courtyard with a waterfall, uh, even a, a working uh, city farm on the roof, um, and it's uh, restoring habitat. So one of the ways they're measuring the success or judging the success of this building is by the numbers of species of birds and butterflies that, they, that they're finding on site. And they have a running tally on one wall of the, of the hospital. So we like to say that uh, this is uh, an agenda that is harmonious with other agen agendas that we want to worry about, including climate change. Uh, we, we're talking a lot about resilience, of course, and we would argue that anything that virtually anything that you can do to make a city more biophilic will also make it more resilient. These are images from another partner city, Portland, Oregon. Um, they've been working hard pioneering this idea of green streets, basically bioswales um, carved from, created from small amounts of, of uh, streets and sidewalks and inserting wonderful nature and greenery in, into neighborhoods, uh, but also addressing uh, the stormwater uh, problem that, problems that city faces. So uh, multifunctional is uh, uh, certainly uh, what we're talking about. How much nature do we need is a, something that we've been discussing, debating a lot. We like to use this uh, idea of a nature pyramid. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to a colleague of mine, Don, Tanya Denklakab, who sort of came up with this idea of the nature pyramid. We've fleshed it out and, and developed it in some different ways. Um, and, and we're trying to get our partner cities to develop their own versions of it, but it's basically something that's, that's fashioned after the nutrition pyramid that we used to use, the food pyramid, as a guide to what you should be eating to you know, have a healthy diet, and that stuff at the top of that pyramid, things that you, you know, wanna eat in small quantities, right? You've got to build your healthy diet at the base of that pyramid, the, the fruits and vegetables. Um, well, there's a similar kind of an, there's an, an analogous uh, discussion about what constitutes a healthy urban nature diet, um, which is interesting. So we can't afford for everybody, we can't afford the carbon footprint for everybody to go off to that Costa Rican rainforest for their uh, contact with nature. We just can't do that. So we've got to develop, we've got to, um, uh, provide the bulk of that urban nature diet from things at the base of the pyramid, things that are closer, things that are around us, things that we're going to see and experience every day or ideally every hour of every day. So um, it is an interesting question though, what constitutes a serving of nature? And we have these kind of discussions. Is it, is it a bird flying by? Is it, is it serving two birds? Is it serving two birds, a few trees, and a green roof? It gets a little silly, but it's um, important. Uh, the cumulative effect of those natural conditions, those natural qualities, are uh, what really constitute the experience of nature in a city. Increasingly, our cities are, in our network, are pushing the envelope and being even more ambitious about the, the uh, vision of their natureful city. Singapore is probably the best example. They have now officially changed their motto from Singapore, a garden city, to Singapore, a city in a garden. And that seems like a small change, but that's pretty, pretty profound. So this idea that we want cities that immerse us in nature uh, and that we want to overcome this bifurcation between built and nature, this idea, I think we've, 
we've, we now realize there's nature in cities, but we, re we still think that to, 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 to experience that nature, you have to travel to it. You have to walk down the street to the park, or you have to find some trees, or you have to go somewhere in the city. Uh, why don't we think about the, the city as a garden? Uh, we're living in the garden, um, and we're living in the park. I, I learned today that Toronto's, um, I, I don't know if this is uh, used uh, today much, but the, the city in a park, right? So um, that's the aspiration that many, many of our cities now uh, have. City in a, a, a garden, city in a forest. Um, so this is wonder, a wonderful building that uh, exemplifies a lot of what Singapore uh, has been doing. They really have been undertaking, uh, adopting a number of, of policies to, to implement this idea of uh, uh, immersive nature. Um, I don't know if you know the, the firm Woha, uh, wonderful Singapore-based uh, firm designing buildings like this, the Park Royal Hotel, which has become a bit I iconic now. Um, Singapore has a requirement that when you build a building, you have to replace at least um, the nature lost at ground level with nature in the vertical realm. And this particular project uh, replaces it at 200%. So it's replacing more than lost at, at ground level. And that's not even counting all of the facades and the kind of hanging nature. It's basically measured from looking down. Um, so the, Singapore has begun to really implement this idea of connecting green rooftops and green walls and, and living architecture with tree canopy and then connecting that with ground level parks and, and really looking holistically at, at their city as a garden, as an opportunity for immersive uh, nature. So a, an even newer building uh, by Woha, um, this wonderful firm, um, is the Oasia Hotel. And uh, it's gotten a lot of attention, uh, been lots of write-ups about it, and uh, I had the chance to stay in it this past uh, summer. And it replaces ground level nature by 1,100%. So that is the friendly competition that's now happening uh, amongst building, you know, amongst developers and architects in, in Singapore. And the most dramatic feature really isn't even counted in that, in that measure, which is the, the outer the facade. There is essentially this trellised exterior that supports 21 different species of flowering vines. So there is something always blooming um, at, uh, throughout the year in this, this building. And uh, I had a wonderful discussion with one of, with, uh, one of the key principals in Woha, uh, Munson Wong, who is the the woe of Woha, uh, who, who likes to talk about how he, he designed this facade for squirrels, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, this is what is happening in places uh, like Singapore. Um, this is an even newer building of Woha, which is a, an integration of social housing, um, um, housing, a, a, a hospital, uh, our health facility, a daycare, uh, so getting young and old together uh, uh, in the same uh, uh, structure, all capped uh, by a forest on the top. So there's essentially a tropical forest, and you can see it a little bit. Uh, let's see, do I have a pointer? I guess I, could, I do have a pointer. I'm pointing on one side. I'm favoring this side of the room, I realize. Uh, but you see the top of that. And then, um, you know, heat and shade are really important things. We're going to have to do a, some very serious adaptation uh, um, in, in our cities. And if you're uh, designing in a tropical, in a tropical environment uh, in a place like Singapore, they will say, well, the last thing we need is a European-style plaza. Um, so what they need is shade. So very creatively, the public plaza is the ground level underneath this, this building and these wonderful green walkways that lead people through that uh, really lovely uh, space. So uh, hard to beat the various things, the interlocking things that Singapore is doing. Um, they have a 50% subsidy for installation of things like green uh, walls. Um, they are engaged in uh, pretty serious uh, tree planting. As I mentioned, they have a comprehensive landscape um, uh, plan. Um, this is an image actually from another part of the Singapore story, which is the, what they call park connectors. They now have about 300 kilometers 
uh, of these, it's a, co a connected network of trails and pathways that take you through the city and um, allow you to move from uh, those highly populated parts of the city to, to major parks, major green uh, destinations. And part of it, uh, my favorite part of it actually is this elevated walkway um, that takes you through the tree canopy uh, level. So really wonderful nature experience in this pretty dense city. So actually, uh, looking at land, Landsat over time, um, this is a city that's added a million and a half in population, but it hasn't uh, gone down in green cover. Green cover has actually gone up at the same time because of all of these interlocking policies. Not the only city, and I'll, I've got some more Singapore, I think, a little bit later, but um, just a few other examples. Um, Melbourne is not quite in our network yet, but we've been in discussions with them. We hope they'll join. They have just finished a wonderful uh, forest plan, which um, um, uh, sets a target for doubling um, their, their canopy by 2040. And that's pretty impressive. Uh, but to me, what's more impressive is that they have decided it's not just about planting more trees in the city. It's about um, envisioning a city in a forest and doing some pretty creative ways of engaging the public in this process. So you may have heard about this. This has gotten some, some international attention, but they have given every tree in the city of Melbourne its own email address. And they've encouraged residents to send loving emails to their favorite trees. <laughs> and the trees write back. Um, which is, and so, and, and it's really funny because they, they're, these trees are getting emails from all over the world now, apparently. So it's, uh, they're, you know, uh, this is biophilia, love, love of nature. So um, we also like to say, in thinking about what a biophilic city is, biophilia is multi-sensory. This maybe is obvious. Can we, can we play the first, the top one? So I have been a big proponent of uh, our thinking more carefully about, oh, that's loud, um, about natural land, uh, soundscapes. Every city needs a sound map and needs to be tracking and monitoring changes in soundscape. And partly it's about the, the health implications of noise. We need to, to do all that we can to moderate that noise. And it's masking the wonderful, beautiful sounds uh, of nature that are so therapeutic and are so beneficial. So uh, the first, what you're hearing now, is actually an eastern wood thrush, which is my, probably my favorite sound in, in east, east Coast US. Um, it, for me, it takes me back immediately to my childhood. It embeds me in place. Uh, I look forward to that sound every year. Um, maybe play the bottom one. Uh, we have a new city, Fremantle, in Western Australia in our network. And one of the birds you'll hear a lot there is the Australian raven. It's a really important part of the soundscape. And it's a different sound. And it's like a baby crying. Ah, ah. And you'll never forget it when you when you hear it. And and we we this biophilia is multisensory, and uh, the sound is especially important, it seems to me. Um, okay, so uh, I do spend a lot of time thinking about birds, and this is a little bit of diversion. But um, a, a biophilic city is a city that uh, pays attention to the spectacle of nature all around it. So um, the uh, latest uh, state of state of the world's birds just came out. I don't know if any of you've noticed it, but uh, pretty depressing. 40% uh, of species worldwide are in decline. Um, uh, what can we do? Cities can do a lot. Toronto is, is a leader in that regard. These are images actually from Portland, Oregon. Two weeks ago, three, two and a half weeks ago, we filmed uh, the sixth annual catio guided tour uh, of catio. Catio is a cat patio. Um, and so one of the major threats to birds, almost th three or four billion um, uh, birds are killed each year in North America from cats, domestic and feral cats. What do we do about that? Well, in Portland, the Feral Cat uh, Association and Portland Audubon got together to do a number of things, including uh, exploring this idea of, ca of catios. It's a wonderful idea. Um, anyway, uh, uh, in September, um, one of the things that happens uh, is that the Vox's Swifts migrate through Oregon, and they uh, would normally um, ro be roosting in old growth uh, tree, uh, tree cavities. But of course, a lot of that is gone. So what they've done is to 
find places like chimneys. And so on uh, just about every evening in September, can we go ahead and play uh, that little snippet of film? We filmed this, but this is just my iPhone. We have a, we have a, 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 a broadcast quality film of this as well. But this is uh, uh, an evening spectacle. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of people come together and sit on a hill and watch this happen as the sun goes down. So these are migrating Vox's Swifts. And at a certain point, they swirl around in mass and you know, uh, roost, fall, fall, essentially dive into this chimney. And at the peak of the migration period, as many as, as 8,000 of them will be um, roosting in this, in this chimney. It's a wonderful story. Can you hear this? Uh, and I guess I don't have a, 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 I'm not showing you the, you can hear the crowd though. And this is indicative of what a biophilic city is. At a certain point, it's, it's funny because uh, a Cooper's hawk flies over and sits on the top of the tower on the, and, and the, and the crowd goes, oh, you know, this is, this, and booing. Uh, and, and, and this Cooper's hawk looking for dinner. And then at a certain point, the Cooper's hawk flies away and everybody claps. You know, I want to support the Cooper's hawk, of course, as well. But uh, this is something you just don't see all the time. Um, so we've got to start paying attention to the, to the nature uh, around us and birds uh, in, in particular. You can get a little sense of it just from my, from my iPhone. Okay. So um, other ways that we think about what constitutes a biophilic city, it's not just the presence or absence of nature, it's like that Portland story, it's how engaged are we with the nature around us. Uh, how much time are we spending outside? Are we able to identify common species of flora and fauna? Are we giving uh, time uh, to restoration of nature in our communities? How, really, how engaged are we in that nature around us? What uh, percentage of our local council budget goes towards uh, nature? These are all ways that we could define a biophilic city. These are images from uh, one of our newest partner cities, Reston, which is a new town, 1970s new town, just outside Washington. And, uh, through a variety of efforts, including things like bio blitzes and an annual uh, dragonfly count and an annual butterfly count, uh, they have reached the point where 50% of the population is engaged in some form of nature, uh, some nature-oriented acti activity and a wonderful nature center. So that's one indicator uh, of how uh, um, biophilic a city might be. Uh, we like to say, I said, said this a couple of times, whole of city. A biophilic city is also a whole, it's whole of life, or another way of saying it, full life immersion in nature. So it's a city that provides that connection to nature early in life, as early as possible, and, and it's getting kids engaged, but then all the way through older age, right, where uh, that contact with nature will be just as important. This is a place we've been filming, it's a little school uh, uh, just outside Atlanta where in fact, the, um, whoops, uh, have I gone back? Um, trying to find the pointer again. Uh, where instead of having one school building, um, the school is designed to have a series of buildings that, that kids go outside all the time. They come with their boots and they go between and among the buildings and they go out into the forest to do their math assignments and they're writing poetry, you know, and they're growing food. There's a farm here, and we got to interview uh, these just wonderful kids. This is something that will make you a little hopeful about the future, I think. So these kids here, uh, um, and we, we interviewed each one individually, and uh, several of them aspire to be farmers, which is not something you hear uh, very often. So there is hope. So full life immersion, uh, full, you know, complete um, life. Wildness is another part of what we think of as a biophilic city, and lots of stories of rewilding the spaces in our cities. Um, this is a story of a 25-kilometer uh, green pedestrian or green trail network along two rivers in, in, uh, in San Jose, Costa Rica. We have one, one city, uh, Curidabat, has just joined um, from the San Jose region. We're hoping to have more, but this is a wonderful story. They've just finished the first kilometer of it. So these are two rivers that are essentially forgotten. They become sort of the back doors of, of uh, homes. 
and they're remarkably biodiverse and natureful, and uh, rediscovering and rewilding those spaces is very important. There is a social equity dimension to this. We believe that contact with the natural world is a birthright, and so we talk a lot and think a lot about what constitutes just biophilia. And uh, so this is actually from our Ocean Cities uh, film. Um, there's a wonderful program in Baltimore that gets kids uh, from underserved neighborhoods onto kayaks. These are kids that live very you know, close by, but have never actually uh, had any contact with the water, with the inner harbor there. And so we actually got on kayaks and filmed, uh, filmed these kids learning, learning how, to, how, to, how to ride them. Um, we believe that just about every space in the city can be uh, rewilded, can be um, much, you know, more, made more biodiverse, can be uh, grown. And this is a wonderful story of uh, Perth in Western Australia where they've converted essentially what was a sterile, uh, chlorinated, uh, typical, um, you know, water feature. And instead of that, highly chemical, um, you know, using lots of chemicals and lots of energy, uh, actually, and converting it to what you see on the right, which is essentially a, uh, a natural, um, biodiverse uh, urban wetland. If you're interested, we have a five-minute film about this story on our uh, YouTube site. This is just from last, from last uh, uh, summer. So uh, the rest of my slides, I've got a, just a little bit of time left, and I want to just go quickly and give you some uh, little vignettes, just little snippets of what uh, partner cities, cities in the network are doing. I already mentioned, I think, that Ed Edmonton is so far the only Canadian city that's, that's in our network. We're, we're uh, really quite, quite impressed and amazed at what Edmonton has done and uh, this uh, importance given to designing their city around ecological networks and uh, investing in things like wildlife passages. They've, they've uh, now completed, I think, more than 27 wildlife passages. So this idea of thinking about how, how animals move through a city, and that's as a, as a sort of urban planning design criterion. That's pr pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Some of you know about the regional green spaces um, strategy. This is uh, uh, very new, called Breathe. Uh, and several different layers that's uh, uh, quite impressive. I don't really have time to talk too much about this, but the other thing about Edmonton that I think is really impressive, there's, a, by the way, a, a five or seven minute film about Edmonton also on our, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, we, you know, we define in part a, a biophilic city as an outdoor city um, and trying to get somebody mentioned, one of you mentioned 90, the 90% or more uh, of the day that we spend inside. It's a challenge. We, we need to be outside more than we are. Uh, and, what, and what do we do, you know, especially in the winter time? And Edmonton's a pretty harsh winter uh, environment, right? More so than, than here. And uh, to their credit, they have developed a winter strategy for getting folks outside. And you all may know about uh, the elements of the story, but there, uh, this, this, the, even winter design guidelines, you know, where do we put warming stations? Where do we need wind breaks? Uh, doing things like this wonderful ice castle that they they build every year, you know, creating reasons to be out outside. Lots of cities have uh, freeways. Uh, Edmonton has been exploring freezeways. You know, the idea that you might be able to skate to work uh, from home to work uh, during the winter months. Getting propelling us outside is a key objective in a biophilic uh, city. Pittsburgh has now joined uh, the network. They're quite um, proud, by the way, of their 42% tree canopy uh, coverage, but it's about connecting to the rivers, getting people to the water, uh, even on the water, um, and designing uh, parks like this new one, the South Shore Waterfront Park, which uh, um, fosters that connection to water, but also is a floodable, um, climate-adapted um, sort of design uh, as well. And here's Mayor Peduto. Uh, receiving the certificate as they uh, joined the network, and this is a ceremony that took place at the Phipps Conservatory in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, so other cities, uh, Rotterdam, we've been in discussions with, we have, they haven't joined yet, but a wonderful story, they appear in our Ocean Cities film. Here's a city uh, with an intimate connection to water, um, but also there's a danger that goes along with the delight, right? And uh, the story of using uh, a variety of biophilic 
design ideas and techniques and tools to address water management, including um, support for green roofs and the really interesting idea of water plazas um, that they've been building. We've, we filmed in a couple of them over the summer. This idea that you design new public spaces that, that add a, a lot to, to neighborhoods, but that also uh, can retain stormwater. So uh, they're multifunctional. Uh, Austin, Texas has joined the network uh, as well. Uh, it's a f kind of similar story maybe to the Vox of Swifts. Um, you, some of you may know the story of the million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats that uh, arrived unannounced um, after the Congress Avenue Bridge in downtown Austin was renovated um, and the crevices were just right for uh, this, these mig migrating bats. They come every summer. Uh, and the first impulse of the city was to eradicate the bats. Biophobia, not biophilia. And this guy, Merlin Tuttle, who founded Bat Conservation International, had a lot to do with changing the view. Uh, they did not eradicate the bats, uh, and then said, instead they, be, they loved the bats. And uh, every summer, hundreds of people come to the Congress Avenue Bridge to wait for the bats to emerge, and they go off in dramatic columns. A uh, wonderful spectacle, but it's an, another illustration of this vision of a biophilic city as a shared space, as a place where we share space with other forms of life um, for them and for us. Uh, Austin has done some other interesting things. They have become a leader in the, the Children in Nature network and movement. Um, and they've recently adopted a, a Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights, and they've also been greening their uh, schools, and school, what they call school parks, these places where parks department and school, uh, school um, district have sort of co-ownership co of spaces. And they're making decisions about where to invest uh, in nature th uh, through a nature equity map, so identifying those, uh, those neighborhoods that are nature deficient. Okay, I'm coming up on the end here. Uh, Victoria Gastez, capital of the Basque Country, another wonderful story, uh, one of our original 10 partner cities, this green, wonderful green ring uh, that circles this compact, dense city. Latest story is what they're calling the interior green ring, uh, actually bringing that nature into the center of the city by daylighting a, a stream, a stream that was, in fact, underwater. These are recent pictures of this project, uh, really wonderful new green amenity for this compact, dense city. Oslo, two-thirds of the city is in protected forest. The other third is densifying. Um, they've also aspired to um, basically daylighting and restoring the eight major rivers that connect the fjord and the, and the forest. Plus, they have one of the most developed urban trail networks of any city uh, in the world. Milwaukee is a, another partner city, uh, wonderful uh, ideas about how to repurpose space. Um, this is one example, Alice's Garden, which is in an underserved neighborhood in that city. It's a place for growing food, a place for uh, community gatherings, a place for uh, job uh, training and for uh, developing businesses that um, uh, relate to, to, to growing and selling uh, uh, food. Uh, they have started a citywide program called Homegrown, which is about identifying vacant lots and uh, combining those vacant lots to create wonderful pocket parks like this one, the Ezekiel Gillespie Park, uh, which was two, formerly two vacant uh, lots. Uh, San Francisco, many of you know the story of parklets in San Francisco, something they've innovated, the idea of taking two or three on-street parking spaces and turning them into small parks, and they've been doing uh, a number of really innovative things in, in uh, inserting nature in this you know, pretty, pretty dense uh, a city. Th these images have to do uh, with the story of how they've created a special sidewalk landscape permit which makes it possible for a resident to actually take up pavement and, uh, and, and do some planting. Um, and it was something very difficult to do. Jane Martin, uh, who founded this nonprofit Plant SF, uh, tried to do it, and she ended up having to ended up being sort of an advocate for creating this special permit, which has now been more than 2,000 of them uh, issued in that city. I'm getting close to the end. A number of our cities are coastal or marine cities. Wellington, New Zealand, is one of our original partner cities. They have an elaborate network of green belts, land-based green belts, and they are increasingly recognizing the importance of the marine nature and giving that uh, as much uh, value and visibility as the land-based nature. So they're developing a blue belts strategy to go along with the green belts. 
Um, I think I have, I think this might be my last slide. I wanted to circle back um, to E.O. Wilson and just talk a little bit about one of our partnerships. Uh, E.O. Wilson has uh, been promoting this idea of half Earth. I don't know if that's something you've been talking about here, but the, the, the really bold notion that we set half the Earth aside for nature. Um, we believe that biophilic cities uh, should also be half Earth cities in the sense that um, we can do all kinds of things to immerse ourselves in, in nature at home, um, but we have to recognize as well that, uh, that urban life and particularly northern hemisphere developed uh, uh, cities have a huge ecological uh, footprint, right? We're drawing material from hundreds of miles away. We have a huge carbon and energy uh, footprint and those uh, are that's having a huge impact on distant nature. So I just want to make the final point that um, we we need to understand biophilic cities. If we if these are cities that love nature, it's not just loving the nature around us. It's loving all nature, and that means loving distant nature and taking full responsibility and helping to to mitigate and repair the damage done by. Um, the, the sort of material flows and metabolism um, that you know our, our cities um, have. So here's the book cover. If you haven't read the Half Earth uh, E.O. Wilson book, I, I highly recommend it uh, to you. So there are lots of resources uh, out there. Um, we tried to get the discussion going in 2010 with this bio, initial Biophilic Cities book. Um, which is meant to be provocative. We have a number of films. This is a film I haven't talked about, but uh, it's also on online, uh, The Nature Cities, and was playing on PBS for a while. Um, there is a newer book called The Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design. So if you're interested in any of the, the 10 partner cities that I've mentioned, like Wellington or Singapore or San Francisco, uh, there are full chapters on each of those uh, cities and about 35 uh, smaller uh, cases, innovative cases, biophilic planning and design cases from uh, around the world. And uh, our push uh, lately um, is uh, to see if we can't get more cities in the global south in our network, and in particular in China and India and in Africa. And so uh, we are organizing some f uh, major forum, uh, major event in China in, in the spring, um, partly to celebrate the Chinese translation of this book, um, but also a major cities summit in Africa. And doing a lot of work, again, to try to um, advance, tr trying to grow this global network. And, and the last thing that I will say um, is that this is an idea that's gaining traction, and it is a, um, a vision, a compelling vision for uh, the kind of cities we want in, in the future, I believe. Um, is Toronto a biophilic city? Yes. Let's take the question mark um, away. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you. We have about eight minutes maybe left for some questions and answer, I, although I know we're running late, but I, my clock says I have eight minutes left. Larry will. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. So, can we? Can we do a little? Okay. Questions or, or comments? Uh huh. Uh, can I get you to take the microphone, please? What's the difference between the green city and the biophilic city? <laughs> One of them is trying to be the, the first green city. So, uh, you know, yeah. Yes, well, London, we've just uh, organized a big event um, in London, actually, um, activating biophilic cities. So we're trying to get, to, in Birmingham in the UK, I didn't have any slides about Birmingham, but they are the first UK biophilic city. It's gaining traction there. Um, we have, you know, some different terminology. Uh, green city is often, you know, used interchangeably with sustainable city. Uh, it's not ne necessarily literally green. It incorporates, you know, energy efficiency and and material flow and, and you know, water and all, all these things that we, we definitely need to, to, to be uh, addressing. Um, so, and there are a lot of other networks and there's a lot of activity. You know, Vancouver is the, has got the Greenest City uh, Initiative. There, there, there are lots of cities aspiring, using different language and, and, and but there, you know, I, I think there's room for us to come together um, and uh, if we can, if biophilic cities can, 
can um, help in advancing a, a green city vision that London has, or can help Vancouver become the even greener, you know, its greenest city, whatever, that's great. Um, I think at the end of the day, what we want to see um, is the, you know, physical change. Uh, and we want to see uh, communities that, you know, are, are more natureful and more restorative and more healthy. Yes, there, there is. I had the one slide about uh, Portland, uh, but as, as we know, r resilience is one of those words and, and concepts in, in ascendancy, right? And we have the 100 resilient cities, and now uh, Toronto is, is one of those 100 resilient cities, and that's really important uh, to think about. Uh, again, I think these are harmonious um, movements and harmonious uh, visions, and any, again, uh, virtually anything that we can do to make a city more natureful will make it more resilient. Not, not always, but almost anything. Are there comments or, or questions? And um, if you are, happen to be from another city, you're not from Toronto, we'd love to hear from you as well. So please, I'm enlisting everyone here to help us build this network. Hi. Um, I'm just curious about, um, like, so originally I think a lot of nature was removed from cities mm. for, from a management perspective. It's easier to manage and control, mm. like cleaning up. And so now that these cities are reintroducing it, what's the management side of managing a forest with, like, a biophilic city like? And is it spurring economic, new economic opportunities or yeah. is there a huge heavy management cost? to manage the environment, yeah. like leaves dropping and that kind of stuff. Yeah, there certainly are those, those extra costs sometimes. Uh, what I will say is that almost everything that I'm advocating is something that pays for itself often pretty quickly. Um, so it, it may be that it is often figuring out the challenge of how you capitalize or how you monetize the, the benefits. We, we know, again, back to shading, uh, we are seeing, you know, he, whatever we do, I, I hope we, we you know, um, we, we don't reach the two, two degree, de degree uh, cap, or it's ideally, you know, one and a half degrees centigrade. Um, uh, I, I'm not very optimistic, frankly, but I ho I'm hopeful. Uh, but whatever we do, uh, we can, you know, eliminate our greenhouse gas emissions right now. We're still going to have a lot of heat and a lot of energy in the system, and we're going to have to adapt. So heat, uh, our cities are heating up. So we've got to think about cooling, really creative ideas for cooling. Tree planting is, is a big part of that, and, and in many other parts of the world, that's part of the answer for, to, to air quality and you know, particulates and other, other things. So, so those are things that we want to do for multiple reasons. And uh, yes, there, there will be management, there'll be maintenance and care um, dimensions to, to that. Uh, I think we need to be more creative about how we do that. You know, we have a, a huge, we've had a huge uh, water stress and, and heat stress you know, in many cities. Or, uh, how do you keep those, those trees watered? Um, in the case of Portland's uh, green streets, um, most of those green streets have a, one or more stewards, you know, citizens who have agreed to take on the task of looking after those spaces. So we have a huge need for engaging people in the community and, and forming friendships and, and overcoming social isolation. So, so the, 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 those challenges of maintaining and managing and caring uh, could be converted, you know, to opportunities. Ideally, that's what uh, should happen. So, other comments or, or questions? Um, it's, it's that drink that's beckoning or that uh, whatever, whatever's coming after this. Uh, so, but look how, how well I've done. <laughs> okay. Thank you.